session. Um, it's great to have uh, Noah Smith, who's uh, actually one of the organizers of, uh, of this workshop. Uh, and is, uh, it's, it's great to have uh, Noah's done a lot of great work in natural language, uh, understanding natural language processing, but as well as in machine learning. So sometimes we do see him at conferences like NIPS and ICML. And uh, he's going to talk about continuous state machines for grammars and logistics and linguistic structure prediction. Logistic structure prediction, that would be something else. OK, I think I'm a little loud. Can you turn me down a bit? Or I'm going to have nightmares. How's that? Ah, a little more? Sorry. I didn't have this. Is it good now? Is it OK for you guys? OK, I think I can live with it. So thank you for inviting me slash twisting my arm to, uh, to come down to sunny Berkeley for a day to uh, talk about some work that's been going on uh, in my group. Um, everything that I'm presenting here is in collaboration with a group of wonderful people, some of them at CMU, some of them no longer at CMU, uh, some of them at other institutions now. Um, and I'll, I'll name all my collaborators as I go through, but I, I want to make it very clear that I didn't do any of this work. I'm just kind of the, 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 the co-author who tags along and then goes and gives talks after the work is all done. Um, the big idea that, uh, that's motivating everything I'm going to talk about today is, and you just kind of have to accept that this is something worth doing. I'm not going to spend a lot of time trying to convince you that we would like to be able to take natural language sentences like the one at the bottom of this slide and convert them into representations that are useful for downstream processing, like information extraction or question answering or um, you know, maybe, maybe even machine translation. Um, and so one example that I like to use is kind of a, just, I'll use this as a running example throughout the talk, is that we'd like to map this sentence into something we call a dependency tree, which is, uh, you know, I'm not going to say a lot about why we have the links we have, why it's a tree. Uh, just trust the linguists, okay? This is, uh, this is derived from various linguistic theories, and linguists uh, will argue about exactly how you should draw the tree, and there are different ways of doing it, and whether it's really a tree or a graph or something else. Don't worry too much about that. Just when I say linguistic structure prediction, think of something like this and imagine that um, it's not completely decided. God hasn't given us the spec for the English language. We don't know exactly what the tree needs to look like. But there's some consensus that building trees like this is going to be useful. And so we're going to think of this as a machine learning problem where we map from strings into trees. OK, hopefully not too controversial. Um, the way that we've been thinking about building these kinds of trees, the algorithms that map from strings to trees, has evolved <laughs> tremendously since the time I started doing NLP. And so I, I'm going to tell you the, the story of that evolution through, uh, very briefly, through uh, the ways that I tended to think about it. And I think w the way I thought about it tended to go along with what most of the NLP community was thinking at the same time. So, so 10 or 12 years ago, um, and even today, when you take an NLP class, the introductory method you learn for parsing into trees is some kind of dynamic programming algorithm. And this was, when I was a grad student, this was the way I saw everything. It was like, everything we need to do in NLP can be boiled down to dynamic programming. And in fact, we wrote this paper called Compiling Compling. That was, you know, it was a little, I don't know, a little overstated maybe. Like, all of Compling is just going to be, all of computational linguistics is just dynamic programming. And, and the nice thing, of course, about dynamic programming, as anyone who's, who's worked with graphical models will tell you, uh, is, is that you get this like polynomial time algorithm for solving your problem. And, and it turns out this is even still useful. So even last year, we were still writing papers about solving NLP problems using dynamic programming. The only difference, so this is, a, this is a cool model for segmenting Chinese into words and labeling the words with parts of speech. Work by uh, Ling Peng Kong from my group. Um, and the, the basic idea is that at the very top, you're going to do dynamic programming. You're going to run something like a semi-HMM or a semi-CRF. The only thing that's new and different is that now we put a neural network over the words to calculate the local scores for the parts that we might build when we do dynamic programming. So when we, do, when we solve the inference problem, when we decide how to, seg how to chop up this, this sentence into words, uh, we're, we're, uh, we're doing polytime inference at the top, but the representations of the parts that we built up come from this deep neural network. Okay, so in some ways, things haven't changed all that much. Please stop me if you have questions. Uh, yeah. When you say polytime, do you mean provably, or is it just, uh, I mean, kind of like dynamic programming? Or? Uh, it's dynamic programming. It's That's, it is provably, yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, and so this paradigm, I, I really don't want this to die, um, this idea that, that you can solve exactly what the best parse is, because that allows you to study your model without studying the inference procedures that you, 
use to you know, make your model work in a real system. Um, and so I think even today, there's really nice work. So, so great paper. Uh, is Joachim Goldberg here? I can't remember if he's coming. Yeah. So uh, Kipper, Wasser, and Goldberg was a paper last year that did this for dependency parsing. It was a beautiful paper. Um, and, and so the, you know, the, the, the high level view is you have some representation learner. This is where, this is where people you know, love to, to plug in uh, recurrent neural networks and, and now convolutional neural networks. And then this just gives you an embedding of all the possible parts that you're going to put together in building your structure. And then up here, you do something like dynamic programming or a spanning tree algorithm or some other combinatorial thing that's provably polytime and fast and efficient. And people, people still like this. However, um, what we quickly realized, um, and what I quickly realized, I was probably a little late to the party, uh, by around 2010, was that when you do this kind of inference, when you, when you boil NLP problems down this way, you really have to make fairly strong independence assumptions to get fast polytime inference. And what we really wanted, what, what we were starting to realize was that we want richer features. We want to be able to look anywhere in the parse tree at all and have things interdepend in crazy ways so that we can take advantage of uh, more of what's hiding in the data and potentially more of what linguists tell us about linguistic theory. Um, so, OK, so, so we moved towards, you know, we, we, we paid a close attention to what was happening in machine learning, and we moved towards using techniques that are more inspired by graphical models. We had this thing called Turbo Parser, which is based on dual decomposition. It's still a really good parser. Things get a little slower in general, but you get much more powerful models, and this got to a new state of the art. Um, with you know some some different kinds of guarantees, you don't get exact polytime inference anymore. Now you get you get an algorithm that gives you a certificate. That's you know when you get the optimal answer, you know you have the optimal answer, and when you don't, well you're you're SOL. Okay, but that doesn't happen too often in practice, and so people were people were happy with these methods. And then more recently, things changed pretty dramatically, um, and so you know between 2010 and 2015. NLP experience like every other applied field of artificial intelligence, an influx of ideas from deep learning. And, um, and so we kind of moved to a different paradigm. And I think this, I'm going to kind of focus on this work in this talk. Um, and I really think the, 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 the idea here, it's kind of a, a radical departure. It kind of says, forget about optimality. Uh, don't worry about getting the best parse. Um, just sort of rely on your representation learner to give you a representation of everything you've done and everything that might happen in the future so that you can make a quick greedy decision and do linear time fast NLP. Okay, so, so, so I think the thing that's exciting here is that we've kind of moved, we've moved to this paradigm where um, you're just going to make everything, you just assume everything is greedy and put all of the work into the representations and unlike Everything in the past, instead of features coming from uh, linguistic theory or, or you know, careful data analysis, you're going to derive as much as you can from the data. Okay? I'm sure you have all heard this story many times by now. Uh, for other problems, um, in order to explain how these kinds of parsers work, I'm going to try and illustrate the basic idea of greedy parsing with a stack. Um, this is not new. This is not from deep learning. This goes back to uh, probably, probably even before Henderson and Nevra were working on, on, on this stuff in 2004. Um, but uh, but th this was when it started being done with statistical models, I think. Um, the basic idea is you start off with your sentence. You have a pointer at the beginning that tells you where you're starting. Uh, and you have a stack, and the stack starts out empty. And you iteratively take steps. I'm going to show you uh, how to derive the correct parts of this sentence step by step. I'm not going to go all the way to the end. It's a long sentence, and we don't have all day. The basic idea is you can shift words onto the stack. That means just move it out of the buffer onto the stack. The pointer advances. The stack now has the word many on it. You can shift again. And then you can do things like reduce left, which attach one word to another. So this one attaches many to millennials, forming a new object, and puts that on the stack. So in, in stack terms, we took two things off the top. We combined them, and then we put the thing back on. So the stack has to be able to hold not just words, but also pieces of tree that we've constructed. Okay, And we keep going. We can shift. We can shift. We can reduce right, which is going the other direction. We can shift. We can reduce right. And what we're, what we're getting as we go, sometimes the stack gets pretty deep, notice, is we're getting kind of a state. At any given point, we have kind of a, a, the stack is representing the state of processing that we've achieved so far. Some of the tree is built. Uh, and some of the sentence is processed, some of it is unprocessed. But you can just look at the stack and the buffer and kind of see where we are and what could happen in the future. And eventually, we're going to get to the point, if we keep going, where we just have one big tree on the stack. We've reduced everything down. Yeah. So um, I, I mean, I only know the stack view of parsing from like, uh, theory of computation. And there, it's non-deterministic. That's right. So 
what's here it's also non-deterministic. Okay. And so what you're what you're doing when you do this with with in a, in a data-driven way is you're gonna train a classifier that looks at the current state of the stack in the buffer and decides what to do next. Okay. So so it becomes, you know, at runtime it becomes deterministic because you always greedily take the best choice. You don't have to. You can use a search algorithm, right, and consider many alternatives as you go and keep them alive in parallel. Um, but what we what we seem to what we have been finding recently is that we can we can do this greedily and it works pretty well. But you get no guarantees. Yeah. Okay. Um, reduce left and so on and so eventually I'm not going to go all the way. Eventually you get the tree. Okay, that's the one thing left on the stack, and you're done. And you can you know you can show for a given parsing problem or a given structured prediction problem you can design a set of stack buffer. Uh, transition functions or operations that guarantee you will eventually get a tree or get a graph or get a thing that is a well-formed output. And you can also show that this will run in linear time if you're greedy. Okay, so that's, so that's where we are. Um, Kevin like, can't believe that he's hearing me talking about greedy parsing. <laughs> so is this like a... This is something in 2010 I never would have wanted to do. <clears throat> and the reason is that you get no guarantees at all, right? You, you basically don't know whether you're respecting your model because you're just making local greedy decisions. Um, and and, and you know, learning, learning is also a little funny. We'll talk a little bit about the, the learning problem because when you train this model, the sort of default way to train it assumes that you've always made the right decisions in the past. And now you're gonna train your model to look at a, a good state that you've arrived in and make a good choice. But what happens if your parser has made some bad decisions in the past? We probably ought to do something else and we're still figuring out what that something else should be. Um, so I, I, I guess the, um, the, the main attraction, the reason people have continued to work on these kinds of models is that at runtime they are very fast. So they're extremely attractive for real world applications. Um, and if they work as well, then fantastic. <laughs> Okay, so here is the, the interesting twist. Um, I'm going to give you a slightly different view of a recurrent neural network and then explain how we use it to implement this kind of stack parser. So I like to think of a recurrent neural network as uh, basically a stack, um, except we only ever push onto it. So we start off with an empty stack at time step zero. We observe a symbol or a vector or something, um, and, uh, and that vector gets fed into some black box and we have a new state representation, we go through some function, I'm not gonna talk about what it is, think of this little black box as an LSTM cell or something like that. Um, and we advance and now we have one thing on our stack and then we observe the second thing. And uh, we calculate the new state based on the previous state and the new observation X2. And so every step we just push, push, push. Okay, so at the end when we're done we have a state representation that kind of encodes the whole sequence. People familiar with this? Some people are familiar with this? Yeah. You are familiar with this. Awesome, okay. <laughs> I mean, the overall picture, is there something particularly you want us to know? Not really. I don't want you to think too much about what's in the black box. Um, what, I want you to, what I want you to think about is that there's a relationship between a stack and the list, the, the list of things that you've accumulated. In some way you can think, what I like to think about is that the state vector here is an encoding of this stack. Okay. I've embedded the stack in a vector. Okay. Now, this, is, this isn't really a stack because I can't push off of it. Right? With recurrent neural nets, you push, push, push. You, you just keep observing. You never get to back up. So what we change in the stack RNN is that you can push, push, and then you can pop. And the only thing that really changes is that you're going to keep a pointer to whatever position you are in the sequence. And when you back up, you simply move the pointer back. And you return, and if you, if you were to query, after having popped off S2, X2, if you were to query the stack right now, you'd get, S, you'd get S3, which is equivalent to S1. It's whatever comes out of this black box at this particular point in time. Yeah. So, so this is the same just ignoring the future events? So the future event is, uh, it's, it, it, you shouldn't call it a future event. It's now in the past. The, the event was that you, you popped the thing off. So you kind of forget about it. You, you forget about it, except that the computation graph lives on. And when you, when you minimize your loss, the, there might be something getting backpropped through from any of these points in the history. But, sorry, but then quick question, if it's, if it's a discrete decision, yeah. how do you do backprop through that? Unless the discrete decision is building the computation graph. 
So at the end, you're going to have this big, I should have a picture of it, but you're going to have this big branchy computation graph. And various points at the top of it, you're going to be pushing back. You're going to be, you're going to be propagating the, the gradient of your loss function back through. So it's really the discreteness goes into the construction of the graph. That's a great question. Could you elaborate a bit on the pop-in operation? It's not really clear. Say that again. Could I? Could you elaborate a bit this pop? Yeah. So, so think about, think about up till here, we just had a recurrent neural net, right? And the only thing that like maybe is a little non-standard is that I've had this little black arrow here all along to tell you where you are. And it's, it's not that important in the recurrent neural net because you're always at the end of the list, right? But now, what, by having that pointer, what I'm allowing myself to do is introduce a new operation where I can choose, all right, I'm going to pop something off the stack, which simply means move the pointer back. The computation that I did here, it still exists. Right? Think of it as a, a graph that I've been building all along. It's still there, but the pointer is here, and that means that when I push the next item, this is the, kind of the important thing. When I push the next item onto the stack, x3, x2 is gone, and when I derive the state for x3, it's going to come out of this black box where the pointer was, and the pointer advances. And so you can imagine if I kept going and pushing and popping and pushing and popping, I'd get a big branchy structure that would represent everything that I had ever pushed on, but then maybe some of them I backed away from again. So S3 is precisely equal to S1? S3 is precisely equal to S1, yeah, yeah. Yeah, nothing changed, yeah. So, so I think we haven't really answered the Russ's question. Sorry. But, I mean, like there are two possibilities. The one that I think you're doing is you train this in a supervised fashion, assuming a particular gold sequence of pushes Correct. and pops. So then, then the answer is there just happens to be one computation graph for each sentence of training, and therefore you can just backdrop through that computation graph. Whereas I think the point of Russ's question is if there's actually uncertainty as to whether you're pushing and popping at different times, and you were having to explore that, that's where you'd not have a way to straightforwardly do backdrop. Right, so, so I guess I'm going to hesitate a little bit because some of the variations on how we train these things do get into exploration. But, but so far, always by building the computation graph first based on the data. So the default is you, build the, you, have, the, you have a supervised sequence of actions, you build the computation graph, you backprop through it. You're not managing uncertainty like you would be in reinforcement learning. Okay. Now, there are variations on the training algorithm where we start moving in that direction because we want some kind of exploration, right? This is the issue with these greedy models that we talked about at the beginning. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that we've yet figured out. I'm not going to talk about that today. Yeah. yeah. So one of the big things that's different in NLP is we actually have fully supervised data here, right? We're not, we're not, trying, to, we're not trying to manage the, all of the uncertainty that you could manage about the, the, the decisions that you're making. Yeah. During training. Uh, you could put attention on it, but you don't need to. That's kind of a separate idea. Um, I think the default would be that you're attending to the most recent time point, right? Without without doing anything more than I, what I've already said, you're just taking the you're just taking the state vector right now as the representation of the stack. Right, so when you pop, it's like you're attending to time point one. Yeah, you could think about it. I guess you could think about it that yeah, way. So, so think about this. At every time, you've got a stack, and you want an encoding of its contents. So you run an RNN over it. You could do that. You would get exactly the same outputs as this algorithm. The problem with that would be uh, you would have to rerun a potentially linear time uh, sequence uh, at every step in the evolution. This just gets that cost of pushing and popping through a sequence of uh, uh, stack configurations from a quadratic time algorithm down. You know, you save one, ex one, one exponent, so it's linear still. It's easy to do, they're just local uh, constant time operations. Yeah. 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 That's a stack RNN. It's a stack RNN that we never actually have to pop off of. Am I saying that right? No, it's that we only pop off of. We only pop off of it, right. And then the stack, uh, we also have a stack RNN for the stack, 
where, uh, where we push and pop and manipulate things. And we're going to have to have a way to represent the things on the stack. So we'll talk about that a little bit more, too. That's kind of important. That's actually really important. And then we're just for just because this is this is usually used in these kinds of models. Uh, in the initial version of, of the parser, we also include uh, a, a, a an RNN that keeps track of all the past actions that we took. So all of the shifts and reduce lefts and reduce rights that we took in the past, they just continually get pushed onto this RNN. So this one really isn't a stack. We never have to pop off of it. Okay, so the, the three different stacks are each represented by a different stack RNN. We use LSDMs for the colored boxes, but that's not really important. Um, and what you're doing when you're training the model is you're deciding, given the current state of the parser represented by these three things together, what to do. Should I, what should I do next? Should I shift? Should I reduce right? Should I reduce left? It's, a classif it's basically just a classifier. There's a little more to it because we often label the edges when we reduce left and reduce right. But that's for, for, for today's purposes, that's not really important. Um, and so this, this represents essentially one training instance. I forget what the correct decision is at this particular point in parsing, but this is where I was somewhere in that animation of the algorithm. And I have to decide, I'm going to train my model to make the correct decision here, which I know from my gold standard data. And what I get out of building the thing this way, as Chris uh, pointed out, is that I'm sharing all of this computation across many instances, because all of these different actions at different points in time while parsing this sentence are all sharing uh, a lot of the same computation. Now, there's an important piece here that, um, that might look a little different than other kinds of applications of representation learning, which comes back to this. So on my stack, I've got, I've got pieces of tree, and I need ways to represent those. And so we use, uh, here we, use, we, we need you know, token representations for words, but also representations for little subtrees. And the way we do this is using something called a recursive neural net, where we construct, so these are, two, these are the two little trees that were on my stack in the previous slide. One of them involved uh, an attachment in one direction. The other involved an attachment in the other. Assume we have a word vector for each word in the sequence. We also have a vector representing the label of the attachment. I haven't really talked about those, except at the very beginning of the talk. Uh, the label and the, t the head and modifier, the, the three things that make up one attachment, are going to be fed in through one little feedforward neural net. And that gives me, this is the sort of a composition function that tells me how to put together the pieces I've already built and assemble them into a single vector, which can then be fed into my red RNN. Um, and so this is like, these are very simple attachments. As I go through and parse, uh, one, eventually I'm going to have something big like this. And the calculation that I do to vectorize that tree is, is the same thing I just showed, just many times over. Right? Recursively, I keep applying these left and right attach composition functions. Uh, and what's, what's kind of important to each of these is that each uh, little subtree that I've built up has a, a head word that carries most of the information. So this is kind of the structure of the computation graph that's feeding in to my stack. So what's the subtree structure there? Uh, what is the subtree structure? This is, a, this is the tree that I built so far involving those words. But is it actually a tree? Can you recover a tree out of this? It, this is a tree. Oh, no, no, no. I meant. Uh, yes, this is, these two things are, this is the representation of that. Oh, it is? Yeah. OK, I'm not seeing that. But there's like a one to yeah, one. Yeah, 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 there is. I did it very carefully. I moved the little boxes around in PowerPoint. And, yeah. uh, no, I mean from the method. Yeah, there's a, like yes, one. yes, yeah. So, so if you think about it, these are, this is kind of the base case, right? I have two words, and I'm attaching them together to form a single link. And I apply this green function once to do that. And I'm going to repeatedly <laughs> apply that green function to larger and larger pieces. I see. So that's why it's a tree. That's why it's a tree. OK, so I, I mentioned learning before. And I think this is, this is a, an area where more exciting things uh, can and should happen, and hopefully will soon. Um, the way we train the models is we maximize the conditional likelihood of the trees given the sentences, or the equivalently, the correct action sequences that give us the correct trees given the sentences. And so this is, you know, this is sort of standard log loss. We regularize. Um, and you know, basically, this is, this is a little bit flawed because you'll notice that every action at every time step during parsing my training corpus is assumed to take place after having made all of the correct actions. So this is the place where a lot of us think better things should be able to happen. But so far, we don't have anything that's really worth talking about. 
Um, and it works. So um, Chen and Manning, uh, thanks to, to Chris and Dan Chi, uh, have given us this really nice example of a deep learned parser for dependencies um, and reported nice numbers in 2014. And we've shown that uh, with various bells and whistles and even without, we do pretty well on English and Chinese parsing using this method. Um, you know, some of the things that are worth mentioning are sort of a, a transformation to the training that constructs the training data uh, sequences in such a way that you get a little bit of exploration. This is called a dynamic oracle. Um, we pre-train word vectors. That, uh, that often is a, is a good thing to do and has given us some benefit. Um, even if you take those things away, we're still doing reasonably well. Um, there's a whole lot more to say about this, and, and I'll refer you to the papers for those. What I want to talk about today are a, a few different variations on this idea, just to show the breadth of what, what this kind of representation learning has allowed us to do. Um, please stop me if, if, uh, if you have questions. I'm going to go into less, even less detail on the next couple of things, because I really want to get to the grammars. OK. So, so one thing that you immediately realize when you start doing, uh, you know, kind of foisting all of the work into the representation learner and, and eliminating most of the human crafted features and basically rely on representation learning plus your design of the structure of the problem uh, to get you a good solution for, for parsing is that maybe you can do more interesting sharing. And so one way to share across tasks in NLP is to start talking about learning from many languages together. So if you talk to, uh, to folks who live in linguistics departments, they will be able to tell you all kinds of great things about uh, sort of language in general, right? Human languages share many properties. And, um, and so we, we, one thing that I've often uh, believed and, and continue to, to be excited about is the idea that if you can parse well in one language, you should be able to somehow use that information to parse another language insofar as those languages share something. What is it that they share? Well, that's a, that's a harder question. Um, so we decided to, to see if we could share parsing. And so uh, this is work, uh, PhD thesis work by uh, Chris's and my student, Walid Amar, who's now at AI2 in Seattle. Um, there are a couple of things you have, to, you have to have first. So before you can build this multilingual parser, you have to have word representations that are shared across languages. And I'm not going to talk about how to do that. Just trust me, OK? There are ways to build word vectors such that words that mean roughly the same thing in two languages are mapped to similar vectors in vector space. You have to have that. You have to be able to identify the language of the sentence you want to parse. And we also have to decide on a way to annotate uh, parse trees across many languages. Unfortunately, a big project at Google called Universal Dependencies has introduced such a scheme for something like 40 languages now. So we have a unified representation, thanks to our friends at Google. Uh, language ID is, is a relatively straightforward problem. And we have these multilingual word vectors. And the basic idea is you apply the same model. Now you feed in one more bit of information, which is the language your data is in. And you train this model on a collection of trees from many different languages, say six or seven. <coughs> Basically, nothing else changes. Okay, so what you're, what you're learning in your, you know, inside all these little boxes, all of these little parameters, is you're learning to share as much as you can across languages the, the labels on these, on these dependencies, the types of labels, the conventions that were used to determine which words should attach to which other words. Those are all shared because of the data uh, that's, been, that's been already constructed for us. And what we're trying to, and the, words, the word representations are also shared because we have multilingual word vectors. And what we're trying to do is learn essentially to share patterns across languages to the extent that is possible. And it turns out that this works nicely. Um, so, you know, numbers uh, slightly ahead of, of others who've tried similar, uh, similar techniques. Um, uh, I, I'm not going to get into the details of, of how these other methods work, but um, essentially I think uh, Malopa, many languages, one parser, is kind of the, the, the simplest way to put together data from lots of different languages and get a single parser. These results are not state of the art for these languages. What's more exciting in, in my mind is when you take uh, a set of languages, so here we took uh, all but one of these languages, plus English, and trained with that language held out, and then went and parsed a totally new language the parser wasn't trained on. And in that setting, where you have, you're basically testing on a target language for which you had no tree bank at training, uh, we're, doing, we're doing pretty well. Um, I don't think we're winning every language, but on average, we're winning by a significant amount. So this is kind of exciting. We, we now have some hope of being able to start doing NLP for languages without annotating data in that language. It's kind of exciting, because there are thousands of languages in the world, only a few of which have tree banks. Um, still a lot, more to, a, a lot more way to go. The numbers for English are up in the 90s. We're not there yet. But, yep. No, in this case, it 
target language, you still need to know word embeddings, right? You still need to have You need to have gotten, that's right, right, thanks. So, so you need to have gotten the words in that new language into the same space as the others. That, that doesn't rely on nearly as much work. You do that, uh, there, there, there are a ton of ways to do it. The, the most straightforward is you get word vectors for both languages, uh, and then you use a dictionary that tells you mappings between at least some of the words in the two languages, and you do, thanks to Chris, you do CCA. I think thanks to Hotel, I know. Okay. Just, yeah. just, okay. But I'll take care <laughs> <laughs> Okay, another, another thing, um, people often glaze over when I start talking about syntax trees and they go, oh yeah, you know, linguistics, blah, blah, blah. But, um, but when I tell them that, that there's, it's, a, it's a relatively short step to get from uh, dependencies that capture the syntactic relationships between words to uh, dependencies that, it's a, it's a simple intellectual step, to get to dependencies that give you the semantic relationships between words. And so there are some data sets that give you uh, what we call semantic dependencies that tell you a little bit more about what the meaning of the sentence is. And so we have extended the stack LSTM parser to also represent, to also build semantic graphs. And uh, so this is an example of a semantic graph. I'm, this isn't in any particular formalism. This is like, you know, my, my version, if I were doing the annotation, this is how I would have done it. The blue words are predicates. Uh, the, the black words refer to, uh, to, to concepts or things. And uh, the unlabeled edges, they should have labels on them, tell you kind of the semantic relationships. And you can see that this is not a tree anymore. Lots of cycles. Um, so, so this kind of representation, I think, gets closer to what many people in building applications for NLP really want. And you can design a set of transition functions that manipulate a stack to build this kind of graph. And you can train, if you have training data, again, uh, you can train a stack LSTM parser that builds this or builds this alongside the syntactic, the syntactic parse by having two stacks, one for the syntax, one for the semantics. The training data here would be graphs. Yeah, yeah, and people produce those. Um, pe some people even like to. Is this AMR or what is it? This is uh, kind of AMR inspired, but it's not exactly AMR. AMR would, AMR would have more stuff on the slide, but it's, it's, AMR is a good example of the, kinds of the kinds of graphs that we're talking about. So the dependencies here don't have labels on them? They, could, they, they should, but again, I'm trying to keep the slide clean, yeah. Okay, so the last thing, how much time do I have? I have like five minutes, including questions. So, I, okay, so this is just gonna be a really quick preview. Um, so this is a more recent version that gets uh, even nicer parsing performance uh, for, for English and Chinese. Um, it's called recurrent neural net grammars, and I think it's potentially uh, more widely useful beyond simply having stacks, but it builds really directly on having this, this stack to capture the state representation. The difference is that instead of using the stack LSTM or a collection of stack LSTMs to represent the state, the, the state in our transition machine, uh, we're going to use it to represent the state in a grammar. So if you remember back to compilers or linguistics class, you've seen trees like this. This is a little different from the dependency tree. This looks a little bit more like what you see in, uh, in, your, in your compilers class. Um, we build we build phrases that are these kind of intermediate nodes. We didn't have those in the dependency trees and graphs. Um, the, uh, the idea is that the, the kinds of models we often use in NLP to, uh, to do parsing into this kind of representation are based on context-free grammars. And you know, a simple step from context-free grammars is to make them probabilistic. And RNNGs go one step farther. Um, gonna skip ahead a little bit. The basic idea is that Instead of simply conditioning your decision about what you're gonna generate next as you generate your tree top down on the parent non-terminal, you're gonna condition on everything that you've done so far. So if we imagine generating a tree top down, we start off by opening up an S at the top, then we open up an NP. Everything we open up, we put onto the stack. And then we can start generating words. And then at some point, we can start reducing and closing up non-terminals. So here what I did was I said, I'm about to reach the end of this, of this noun phrase. I'm going to go back up to the, point, the last point where I had an open non-terminal. And I'm going to close it. And now I've built a phrase. Similar to what I was doing when I was building up dependency trees piece by piece, I'm doing the same thing now for phrase structure trees. 
And so we can build this grammar in a, in a very similar way to the way we built the stack LSTM. It's a different set of operations. It's a different set of substructures. But things are very parallel to what we did before. The thing that's really exciting here is that it's actually a generative, where do I want to go? No, I don't want to go back. Sorry. It's actually a generative model. Um, I thought I had a slide where I talked about the objective function. Yeah, so, so you can train this version of the model either conditionally the way we did before uh, as a discriminative model to predict the, to maximize the likelihood of the tree given the words. You can also train it generatively. And that was actually the way I showed it. <laughs> Notice that the buffer started out empty. And when I generated a word, I added it to the buffer. So instead of processing the sentence that's already been handed to me, I'm actually generating it as I go. And I can train this as a generative model. And it turns out in experiments that for, for reasons we don't fully understand yet, this seems to work much better than training it as a discriminative model. Um, so these are numbers on the sort of classic pen tree bank phrase structure parsing task. These are numbers on the, I, what I think more useful uh, uh, Stanford dependency task where you're mapping, the, you build the tree and then you use rules to map it into dependencies. And we're getting really solid results. And what's really interesting about the recurrent neural net grammar that we found in recent experiments is that you can actually drop a lot of that. You really, what you really need is the stack. You don't actually need to represent these other things to make your decisions. Kind of shocking and, and I think linguistically interesting. So there are a whole lot of other details I didn't get into, like how we're doing inference, the fact that now in the recurrent neural net grammars, we're not actually using uh, part of speech tags. Uh, we, uh, the, the composition function here is also kind of interesting and, and deserves more discussion. If I had more time, I'd talk about that. Experimentally, we're getting, we're getting very strong numbers, uh, particularly on Chinese. Um, this works well as a language model, if you like language models. And the newest paper presented, uh, I think, next week at EACL in Spain uh, shows that RNNG seem to be learning head rules, which are kind of an important idea in, uh, in the theory of syntax. So I think that's a good place for me to stop. I'll just say, in NLP, representation learning turns out to be great. Um, we're not doing representation learning without doing anything else. We're building in a lot of inductive bias by setting up our problems based on things like stacks and grammars. And that seems to be important, given that we have limited data to learn from, limited annotated data. Um, so I'm not giving up on things like classic symbolic structures. Uh, I think these two things fit together really nicely. And uh, in ongoing work, we're moving kind of back to the graph-based paradigm, where we can do uh, either exact or nearly exact inference at the top and get maybe better inference guarantees, but we're still getting the benefits of reinforcement learning underneath. Um, so there's still a whole lot more to be done. And I think all of the questions that we've worried about in learning for language are still relevant and still important. Um, and so I think, I think there are going to be a lot of new developments in this area. And I look forward to talking with you more today. Thank you. <laughs>